kids with something that I just wanted to, you know, leave it over here. Because growing up in a neighborhood, uh, I come from the projects out of Cleveland, Ohio, and people in our community don't look at diabetes like a, uh, um, they don't look at it as, as significant as they should look at it because we look at it like it's a little sugar. Oh, baby, don't worry about big mama having a little sugar because grandma had it, granddaddy had it, the aunts have it, the uncles have it. So it's just a little sugar. It's not something that we should take serious. And I, too, like everybody in my community, in my neighborhood, in my family, I didn't think about it as anything else other than a little sugar until I found out that this is a debilitating equal opportunity destroyer. It doesn't care how cute you are, how charming you are, how fabulous you are, how famous you are. It will take you out, and, and it's taking us out at an alarming rate. Just by the show of hands, for those of us who are here, how many of you have or know somebody who has diabetes? Now, that's all of us in this room. And this is why it became imperative that I do this. I didn't know that I, it was going to be imperative to me because I wasn't trying to discuss this with anybody. I don't want people looking at my shopping cart. I don't want people asking my mother, love, what you eat? Should you be eating that? I don't think, you, you know, just put all of that down. You know, I, I just didn't want to have to go through that. So I wanted it to be my personal, you know, it's my issue. It's my sugar. I don't have to worry about it. And listening to my family members, now, my mother had type 2 diabetes, my sister had gestational, my younger sister had type 1 diabetes, so you pick the diabetes, it's in my family. And I'm thinking, I don't have it. I don't make it through adulthood. I'm skating through it. I'm going to do all right. I'm doing all my other stuff. I don't have to worry about it. And then now I'm mother love, so I don't have to worry about this. Well, in 1990, I'm here in California doing my, my mother love thing. They brought me here from Cleveland, Ohio to come in. Shake Up Talk Radio. So I came to Shake Up Talk Radio. And I, they put me on a KFI radio. First African American woman, black color, woman of color, pick one, whatever we were at the time. They put me on talk radio. Quit smoking cigarettes. <sighs> Quit smoking cigarettes, gain 40 pounds. That should have been a clue right there because this, one of the symptoms of diabetes is sudden weight gain or sudden weight loss and I wasn't trying to I wasn't trying to lose any weight and I certainly wasn't trying to gain any weight. And I just attributed to the fact I quit smoking, I can taste food. You know, if any of you ever smoke cigarettes, nicotine will dull your senses, dull your tongues. So I figure I quit smoking. I'm eating up everything on the menu, but thank you, call again. Gain forty pounds like that from January to April. To gain that much that's like almost ten pounds a month. I mean I'm like <laughs> And I really wasn't eating that much. So I go to the doctor, and, and, and I'm, I'm getting some of the other symptoms as well. You know, I'm getting the itchy skin, I'm having night sweats, I'm real moody, I'm having moods. Could you imagine? Lovely, charming, cute, adorable me. <laughs> having a mood swing. One day I'm talking to you, hey, Les, how you doing? Next month I'm like, why are you looking at me like that? Don't look at me. Don't say that to me. I'm sorry. And I'm like, what the heck is wrong with me? So because I'm aware of what the symptoms of diabetes are, I go to the doctor and I'm getting my regular checkup and I say to him, I want you to give me a glucose tolerance test. He looked at the me on. I said, no, 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 no. I'm dealing with symptoms of, you know, diabetes. I got excessive thirst. So if you're drinking a lot, you're peeing a lot. So I'm going to the bathroom. I mean, I'm going to the bathroom so much. I live in Pasadena. I'm knocking on everybody's door because I know where everybody's bathroom is between Pasadena and L.A. I mean, I'm not, uh, excuse me, my lover, I'm going to go. I need the bathroom, please. Let me go. I'm doing it. Oh, I got to go to the bathroom. I mean, constantly. So I go to the doctor, and I'm asking him to give me a glucose tolerance test. You know, and a lot of doctors are real arrogant. They get egotistical, and they'll say stuff like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't need a glucose tolerance test. I'm the doctor. I'm, t I'm like, look. Everybody in my family got some kind of diabetes. You name it, we have it. Give me a glucose tolerance test. He refused. I said, that big fat tank body down in the middle of his office, cross my legs Indian style. Yeah, get a visual. I could do that then. Just because I was big didn't mean I wasn't flexible. I sat right down and I said, I'm not moving unless until you give me a give, let me get that test. And he was like, Oh my God, I got all of that in the middle of the floor. Okay, get up, get up, get up. Sign me off. I went down. He called me a couple of days later. He said to me, I wish 
all of my patients with this disease would be as proactive as you are because you have type 2 diabetes. We need to get you on some kind of program. Fine. Okay, so now I've got to see a nutritionist, and I've got to see an endocrinologist, and I've got to see an ophthalmologist, and I've got to see a podiatrist, and I've got to see a heart specialist, because all of these things are things that can go wrong. If you keep mismanaging or have ill-managed diabetes, we, especially as African Americans, more of us are suffering from retin diabetic retinopathy, that means we're losing our eyesight. More of us are on kidney dialysis, that means we're using, losing the use of our kidneys. More of us are suffering lower limb amputations because of ill-managed and mismanaged diabetes. More of us are having massive strokes. More of us are dying prematurely. And I know what I'm talking about. My mother died at 59, my father at 31, my brother at 39, my sister at 51. At 44, they amputated my younger sister's leg. So it's just a matter of time. Ding, 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 ding. When the light bulb going on, Mother Love, when is it going to go on and you're going to realize you've got to get your health together? So the light bulb went on. And I had to do something to get my life in control, get my numbers under control, get my blood sugar under control. Because it would be 60, it would be 240. It would be 98, it would be 320. It would be just ridiculous. And that's when people start having the complications from diabetes because we're not eating what we're supposed to eat. We, I don't even know what a normal size portion of food looks like anymore because I'm just like everybody else. I wanted two pies, give me two servings. Ooh, it was so good, let me eat it again. Ooh, it was so good, let me eat it a third time. Let me eat it a fourth. Listen, and I wanted everything. You know how we talk about food. Ooh, we like it chicken and we like fried fish and we like, look, we fry vegetables. We will figure out a way to fatten up and can you be frying a vegetable. That could tell you something is wrong with your diet. I mean, here God has given us all the stuff we need, all the green, you know you want to come over here and sit down with me. All the green leafy fruits and vegetables because you know I'm telling the truth and we will find a way to make it fat. Anytime you dip in broccoli and cauliflower and squash, dipping it in batter so you can deep fry it. Something that's going to be good for your body. Well, now we're just going to damage this to the point. It's just going to have no nutritional value. We got a problem. And I know, because I like them fried vegetables, and I like fried green <laughs> tomatoes, and I like fried okra and fried corn and fried, fried. Look, I could fry air if you let, give it to me long enough. I could deep fry some air. Anytime you would take a piece of bread, Swallow it with butter. Don't even put it in the pan. Just sit it on the eye. Just let the grease drip down, you know, so that it catch fire so you can take it off and that's your own kind of toast. Well, maybe y'all didn't do that, but we did that all the time because we didn't go camping. So we fried the bread just on the open on the open flame, you know, like we was at camp or something. We have a problem because we don't want to do what God meant our bodies to do, and that's eat clean healthy, nutritional food. We don't want to get up and run. We don't want to exercise. This is not exercise. This is not exercise. This is not a table. We, and neither is the dashboard in your car. We have gotten away from eating healthy, clean food. I'm not saying it got to taste like, you know, whatever. I mean, we just don't want to eat healthy, clean food. We don't want to make healthy choices because, and I understand completely, because it's the comfort of Food makes us feel good. I know food makes me feel good. I like to eat when I'm happy. I like to eat when I'm sad. I like to eat when I'm mad. I eat when I'm glad. I found out I was an emotional eater. I wanted to eat any time of the day. Look, when you're waking up on Tuesday trying to figure out what you're going to have for dinner on Thursday, you got a problem with food. And that's what I was doing. Ooh, it's Tuesday. I kind of ate. And we eat breakfast. We don't want to eat breakfast. And that's what it is. Break your fast. We don't want to eat, eat, want to eat late at night, late night eaters. Listen, I could wake up in the morning, wouldn't be hungry because I'd have ate up everything I could think of on the menu, but thank you, call again the night before and wonder how to, when I'm going to put my pants on, I got to do one of these and I'm going to jump all the meat in because it ain't sitting like it was supposed to. Or if I could actually get it button, got to hold on to the button because if I let it go, it's going to pop off across the room, put your eye out, at least put a dent in your forehead. I used to put the button up my pants and tell my husband and son, Duck! I'm buttoning up my pants! Because it might pop off. That's because when I ate so much the night before, I wake up the next day, I'm full. So I don't need to eat breakfast. All day long, running, moving, walking, whatever it is I'm doing, doing my mother love thing. About 2.30, I 
I'm crashing in the toilet and I'm grabbing whatever it is I can eat. And that is such bad nutrition. Then I wait again because I done filled up on a candy bar, some soda pop or some potato chips or some cheese whiz or something that had no nutritional value to it. Then I wait again, then 9 or 10 o'clock, then I want to eat. And this vicious cycle went on and on and on for years until I finally developed type 2 diabetes. Because here I am running around, you know, but I'm thinking I'm flying all over the country, flying all over the world. I'm meeting these people and talking to these people and then, you know, they always want to feed the fat girl. Because I'm comfortable in my own skin. Oh, I was a fabulous fat girl. I wasn't ashamed of it. I'd be the first one coming. You buff it, follow the fat broad to the buffet. And Hollywood, you know, they will put out a spread of full hundred thousand dollars worth of food. Them little skinny one bone chicks come in, they eating up everything. I mean, whooping down food like army men. Then they excuse themselves from the table. Then they go in the bathroom and they throw it up. <coughs> and I'm like, baby, what's I'm not gonna I'm not gonna you go Oh no, don't worry, mother love, I'm okay, I'm just purging. I know what purging means. That's different to throwing up. Purging means you are forcing this out of your system. It doesn't mean that you're sick from something. It means you ate too much. Now you got it. Now you want to throw it up. And they would throw up all the food, and then they cut fix their makeup, and they come back out. I'm like, listen. If y'all get me in there throwing up, call my husband. Something wrong with me. I'm sick. I am not deliberately throwing up all this high-priced caviar, smoked salmon, capers, moochie out to do pheasants and stuff I've never eaten. Look, I'm trying to find my big purse to put some of this Take some of that on. Because see, well, I know I'm never going to get to see a spread like this. And I want this. Listen, I was at the party. Look, we was at the Oscar party. This is what they had. Look, I played something for you. I'm bringing all my, ain't no shame in my game. And they would do this. That's, that's just as bad. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, this is not a good thing. Something is going on. Then when you see your family members dying one by one from diabetic complications, one by one. We started out in my immediate family, eight. There are three and a quarter of us left. I mean, okay, four and a half. Because they amputated my younger sister's leg. They put stents in her heart. She's blind in one eye. She's losing her eyesight in the other one. Her skin is harder than this chair because people with diabetes lose the sensation in their skin. And her skin is so hard. There's almost virtually no circulation. She called me the day to tell me to put a hospital bed in her room. She's on a morphine drip. So maybe she doesn't want to accept the fact that she has gone into hospital care. She's standing on her last leg, and they were talking about cutting it off, and she won't let cut it off. So it's poison her body. She won't put smoke and cigarettes. I saw her last a few weeks ago while I was on a road trip, and she said to me, I'm like, sweetie, when are you going to take responsibility and turn your health around? She told me, you want to get well with diabetes. Look, I'm going to smoke. I'm going to do whatever it is that I want to do, and I'm going out on my terms. She won't fight for her life. So how am I supposed to fight for somebody who won't fight? I have to fight. I have to. Do, I have had to decide to fight. Now I talk about a good segue. Speaking of fighting for my life for diabetes, I'm one of the national spokespeople for the American Diabetes Association's new campaign because I was going to get too weepy, and I, so y'all just have to, you know, roll with it. Um, it's hard to watch people that you love and that you care for not take this disease seriously. So that's why I know what I'm talking about. I'm not some talking here. You're, oh, yes, and I can tell you about diabetes and give you the statistics and get to put the half off. I live with this every single day. Every day I'm scared to hear the phone ring because they're going to tell me one more sister is down. One more niece. One more uncle. One more aunt. One more cousin. And I'm tired of it. It got so bad in our family. My husband and I, that's my handsome husband back there. I really do have a handsome husband. Because people always see my husband and go, Oh, mother love, your husband is so fine. I'm just, just a sidebar. Do I look like I would have an ugly man? <laughs> I'm just asking. Do I look at people and say, How she get a fine man? I say, Somebody loves her like that. Because I'm a fine woman. And what women don't understand about men, people always say, Now, how that big old fat woman get a man? How he just don't know them? Because she is obviously doing something that he likes, that he needs. She is making sure his needs are met. His home is clean. He's in a safe environment. 
He's in a loving environment. So and see, it's a little bit of skinny one bone kid that think they have to think that they have, that's all right. It's a bookstore. He gets to come in here and do his thing. They always think, you know, you have to be a little tiny, cute, that, no. You have to be confident in who you are when you walk into the door. That brother needs to know that he is going to receive something because he's giving something out. That he's just not going to be sucked dry or have to look at somebody else's access baggage because she made a bad decision someplace else down the line. I think that do our men so unfairly. And I tell women, listen, you don't have a man because, or you, because you're not confident in who you are. You don't have a good man because you're not being a good woman. You don't have a good man because you so busy telling this guy over here, you dogging Harry out for something Bruce did five years ago. Bruce ain't nowhere around. You gonna give him power over your life like that? It's like diabetes. It's like being in a bad relationship. You either make it work for you, or it's gonna work against you. I've decided to take the conscious choice to make it work for me. I'm not going to, something's going to jump out the bushes and grab me. I make no mistake, I know I am not going to, well this body is not going to live forever. I'll be able to live forever in print, on film, TV, radio recording, but my body one day is going to wear out, and I know that. I just don't want it wearing out fast sooner than it needs to because I decided I wanted to sit on my fat butt and didn't want to make a conscious choice to take control of my diabetes to say, I can make better choices in eating, I can make better choices in shopping, I can make better choices in cooking, and I got so tired of my, our folks saying, well, I don't want to follow the diabetes diet. That food tastes bad. It tastes like cardboard. Well, when the last time you chewed on some cardboard <laughs> that you could compare it? You know, if when you can make a better choice, you, you understand about spices and blending foods and food groups and things like that. When you understand, it's not going to taste like, I'll make a sugar-free key to to make you smack little kids and wait till they can't have none. I learned the other day, I did my first low-fat, low-calorie macaroni and cheese. It was the, he looked at me like, yeah, right, low-fat macaroni. Honest to goodness, my son comes in because when I first got diagnosed with diabetes in 1990, my husband, God bless him, he sat everybody down, he said, listen, mom has diabetes, her eating habits have to change, her food choices have to change. And this is my wife, she is not your personal short order cook, so we're going to eat what she eats. That's how that's going to roll. However she eats, however she cooks, that's how we're going to eat. So I had them off of pork bacon for two and a half years before they even knew it. They just kept saying, the bacon tastes different. They never said the bacon tastes bad. They said the bacon tastes different because it was turkey bacon. And I would just put a little olive oil on the stove and fry it in the griddle so they don't know. But I learned how to make a low-fat, low-calorie, low-carbohydrate macaroni and cheese. And our son came in. He was like, oh, my gosh, we made some real food for a change. Ooh, mama, we just tell you, we just... So, and they don't see me use, eat macaroni and cheese. The pasta has too many carbohydrates in it for people with diabetes. It elevates your blood sugar too high. So I just stopped eating. Well, he actually saw me. He was like, this is not real macaroni and cheese. Now, mind you, after he done ate almost a plate of it, he goes, this is not real macaroni. This is some of your diabetes food, isn't it? I said, well, what, tell me what it is. Mom, this is some of the best macaroni and cheese you ever <laughs> made. This is the bump. I made it with egg beaters. Uh, 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 what lactose free milk, smart balance, and this pasta called, he had to be on camera, this pasta called Dreamfield's Pasta that only five grams of, <coughs> of, of, five grams of carbohydrates digest in your system. The rest of it is <coughs> much out here. And I tried it. I tried it because I said, yeah, I want to get this. Tried it. Hour after I ate, test my blood sugar. It wasn't elevated. Two hours after I ate, my blood sugar was going back down. I was like, oh my God, this was the bomb. This was the bomb. So, and then I did put a secret ingredient in it, but y'all have to log on to my website to find out what that secret ingredient is. Mm -hmm. Or you got to buy the book. And, and it's got a lot of recipes in it. It has a, 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 a resource guide in it. it. It tells about my struggle with diabetes, my family history with it. How, and, and it's broken down into two parts. Before my life, before I made a life change, and after after I made a life change. And there are drastic situations on both sides of it. I couldn't believe the relationship that I had and how the dynamics of 
my family members, and my friends change. Be careful when you start changing your life and your lifestyle and you go going to a higher level. I mean, with anything, losing weight, smoking cigarettes, coming off drugs, getting to Christ. I mean, I cannot believe. I'm thinking these people are going to embrace me because, you know, I want to take care of myself and my health. Are... Folks cut me off. I mean, people I had been knowing they cut me off, said things to me I never would have thought my friends would have said. You know, uh, you make enough to look bad because you take a private approach to your health. Now we all got to sit around, you're going to be the only one leading the way. Now you're trying to make us. A... Well, why don't you get on a journey with me? Come on, we can do this together. I remember when we were out, when I was young, my son was little, I was a welfare recipient. You just thought I said I was a sniper the way my mom and my his daddy acted. Uh, you are welfare? Oh my God. Anyway, I was on welfare. But, so I had said to my girlfriend, you know, this is not enough for us to sustain. So maybe what we do is we co op. You know, we'll take $50, I'm um, take $50 a month, put it in a bank account, and at the end, you can't tap into this resource until after the 15th of the month. Because, you know, when you got a fixed income, it's always too much month at the end of your money. I tell you, by the time the 20th comes, you're like, how are we going to get these through these next two, 10 days before this next check comes? So I'm like, okay, this is what we're going to do. We'll take $50 and we'll buy big tubs of, like, soap, deodorant, toilet paper, toothpaste, flour, sugar. We'll get a deep freezer. I was even willing to let the deep freezer be, because I was the only one who had a basement. Let the deep freezer be in my basement. So that's a life bill I'm incurring. You ain't got to pay it. When you come in after the 15th and you know we'll buy half a cow or half a pig, or whatever it was, we'll put it in the deep freezer so we'll always have meat at the end of the month. We'll always have washing powder. We can always do our laundry. We always got soap. We always got sanitary pads. We always got baby diapers. If I tell y'all, them chicks looked at me like I was crazy. And let me tell you what he at right now. This is no brag. This is a fact. This is what God will do. When you put God first and let God conspire to open up the universe, they still sitting in the project. Ain't clean. Tell me, oh yeah, that's my girlfriend, Mother Love on TV. Now we come from the same neighborhood. They should be standing right beside me or, you know, even bigger than I am. You know, I'm just... It's just, we don't work together. And one of the reasons why I wrote this book is to help us. Not help anybody else, to help my people, to heal my people, to show my people, to be a living testimony to what God can do when we are obedient. This wasn't my call, this was God's call. And when you step into your purpose and get on your mission, I had to get a debilitating disease to understand what my mission was. And my mission is to go and be a living testimony to the power of God and what He will do in your life, up to and including healing from a devastating disease. I am Mother Love, and I thank you all for coming to me. Right. So that's what she asked. One question. If you have any questions, I'm willing to answer. Well, I'd, I'd like to. Um, uh, the. Uh, this instrument that you were talking about, you told the doctor to, to give you this... Glucose tolerance test? Yes. I never really heard of it. Every time I go to the doctor, and it's like every six months, uh, I I always tell him, you know, make sure you check me for for uh, um, diabetes mm -hmm. and I have him do a blood test. And they say, you know, you're borderline, but you're not there. Yeah, I have a history of it in my family. But I never told them... Is that a specific test or a that specific test? A glucose tolerance test is a specific test. And if your doctors are telling you you're borderline, there's no such thing as borderline diabetes. Well, it's pre-diabetes.